Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me and apologies for the informal uh, paper in my hand, but um, I've slightly tweaked this from the conversation we had in Vienna to perhaps broaden it out a bit. So uh, my name's Claire and I'm the Director of National Resilience at the Cabinet Office. And that means that I have spent the last two and a bit years leading government's response to COVID. And I wanted to share with you some of the work that we've done and some learnings. And I am going to start with a video. Uh, it's a wee bit out of date, but I think it does the job. The number of cases of COVID-19 outside China has increased. From this evening, I must give the British people a very simple instruction. You must stay at home. COVID-19 is spreading quickly across the country. This puts many people at risk of serious disease. Look them in the eyes and tell them you're doing all you can to stop the spread of COVID-19. Hands. Face. Space. What's up, we're Jordan and Perry, and this is your coronavirus conundrum. Love you, Mum. Protect your loved ones, get the app. That's why we're doing everything we can, as quickly as we can, to protect your economic security. Thank you, and I hope all of you at least witnessed one of those in real time and were served it as a member of the public. Actually, as I say, it's a wee bit out of date because um, in reality it ended up being around 27 major campaigns, and you can see examples of them on the screen. But in reality, this was the biggest peacetime communications challenge in living memory. We had to protect the NHS and save lives, we had to support businesses and the economy, we had to help society to function as normally as possible and to secure vaccine uptake and the eventual end of the crisis. And as I say, we'd ran by the end about 27 campaigns and averaged a reach and frequency weekly basis of around 96% with 17 opportunities for every one of you to see it. But I want to share a wee bit about how we did it. So our job as civil servants is to provide advice to ministers and we had to work out what we would need to do. And in order to do that, we knew we'd need to build the, big, the broadest, biggest team and draw on a big variety of sources to do that. And so on the 3rd of March 2020, I was asked to set up and lead the National Resilience Hub, which was a cross-disciplinary team made up initially of volunteers who came together to deliver this function. Uh, and it had data, audience insight and behavioural science fully integrated into what we did. And our job was to run the biggest communication campaign in the history of government. And in order to provide this advice to ministers, there was an immediate need and demand for insight and evaluation. And the extraordinary pace of the developments and the requirement for this insight meant we conducted and commissioned the largest programme of research. 
So we launched the most comprehensive programme of qualitative and quantitative research ever undertaken in government and drawing down data on a scale and frequency that had never been undertaken. We were conducting research um, and analysing it on a 24 hour cycle, working through the early hours of the morning to crunch the data, to put it in an easy to understand dashboard that we could present to the Prime Minister, senior ministers and other decision makers every morning at 7am to help inform and shape their discussions of the day. And what this has enabled us to do is to build one of the richest sources of audience insight and campaign effectiveness that government has ever had. To provide this advice, we've built a real-time dashboard. And uh, you can see on the screen there that some of the sources of data we used. We worked with um, ONS and industry partners using ethically sourced and anonymised data, building a real-time dashboard using the widest range of data sets. Um, so you can see some of the more traditional ones like online shopping habits, travelling, number of kids going to school, etc. But we also started looking at new data sets such as analysing wastewater samples in a local area so that we could start modelling and predicting the number of hospital beds capacity that we might need to have or where we might need to put in place some local restrictions. And all of this enabled us to build up the richest sense of how people were responding in real time and what we might need to do differently and advice we might need to provide. I'm willing to bet most of you watched one of these press conferences. Um, so as I said, we put all of this data into dashboards um, and these were used by uh, across government and by prime minister and ministers. But when lockdown occurred, we built a virtual press conference system and we held these daily TV briefings where journalists were able to ask questions. And we used the data from the dashboard to be shared with the public and we developed the, those data uh, dashboards that I'm sure you saw on television. And actually during this process, the UK government became the second most viewed publisher behind the BBC News. And this was achieved by live streaming these daily press conferences via Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn and YouTube. And this also obviously provided free airtime to push out really important public messaging. But uh, we all know journalists tend to ask a very similar strand of questions over and over. And we knew the public had loads of questions about what was going on. And so we built and launched Ask.com in seven days, which was an online system that enabled the public to ask questions themselves. And the response was genuinely amazing. So the very first question was asked by Lynn. She was a, a grandmother from Skipton who wanted to know when the five tests had been met, would she be able to hug her grandchildren? And it would be fair to say at that point, she became a minor celebrity um, and, and enjoyed lots of attention. But actually for me, what was also born was a really new, rich data set. So we had 65,000 questions on the very first day alone. And as you know, we continued to run it throughout. And what that meant is I got this amazing data set of the questions people wanted to know, the things they were interested in. And that enabled me to look at where they were asking that question, where in the country was it coming from, what were they most interested in, and therefore where the information gaps were in the comms that we were putting out. So I was able to cut it by region, by nation, by topic, and push out really hyper-local geo-targeted communications in that area. So if, for example, people in the northeast of England were asking about travel restrictions, I could really geotarget our messaging there, work with our local partners in the area and push out more of the comms because obviously what we were doing wasn't cutting through. And so that enabled us to test and learn at a really rapid pace. And this amazing new data set was added to all of our other sources of data and it enabled us to develop some really comprehensive audience insight and segmentation, which we were able to use to shape and inform our comms campaigns. We could see and understand what the public were thinking, feeling and doing and able to address comms campaigns to help fill that gap. And I just want to show you some of the stuff we did over the last couple of years. Oh, we have the deck is unfortunately out of date. I will uh, slightly wing it now. So what we did is we ended up having a really huge evaluation programme and you can see there on the screen what we ended up doing. And that was a very much a test and learn and iterative process. So. We planned for success by joining together the research that we did for all the policy and comms teams across government using consistent approaches to setting objectives and KPIs for each campaign, enabling us to measure and compare performance across them. We commissioned a really wide range of research, as I've mentioned, to measure both the public and business attitudes and behaviours, sometimes at less than 24 hours notice, and using this research to inform decision making across government. 
We had an iterative approach to evaluation. We began with rapid analysis, reporting trends on single data sets. And then we were able to synthesize the research and other data sets using digital response, social media analytics, etc., to provide a more sophisticated analysis that looked at the factors that drove public behavior and how comms could be more effective at changing and sustaining new behaviors as the pandemic developed. So this systematic approach to data capture, and you can see some of the dashboards there that we used to help share it, um, it enabled us to start to model behavior and ultimately calculate the number of lives that were saved due to the campaign. And we reported, we reported and reported and reported. I wanted all of this data to be shared and used, uh, not just by me and my team, but by other people across government. So we broke all of the previous rules about not sharing data and research, and we put it out far and wide. And what you can see on the screen there is um, our five things report. So every single week, we said, what five things have we learnt you know, that are problems? And therefore, what are the next five things that we are going to do to help make things different? And what that led to was a really fast and iterative process of online and offline innovation, many of which you can see there, and a number of which were really big digital firsts. So, for example, uh, we, uh, we did uh, city-based targeting on TikTok. We were the first government advertiser to um, advertise on Nextdoor, and we did innovative work with chatbots. And so I'm going to take you through a case study um, of our vaccine communications work that we did. And you might remember 90-year-old Margaret Keenan. She made headlines across the nation and globally for becoming the first person in the world to get a vaccine. And as you know, you know the, the UK was the first country that had a vaccine programme. And it was developed and it was approved and it was rolled out in less than a year. And of course, we're all being uh, less than a year after WHO had said that this was, um, that this was a, a big virus. And so it quickly became the kind of the big beacon of hope. It would be the thing that meant we would uh, be able to start moving back towards normal. And it was also one of the things that government was being judged on in terms of its handling. But if you think back to November 20, 2019, we've all kind of got used to vaccines taking a really long time to develop. And uh, this was a very big international effort, but there was a lot of hesitancy to, to this vaccine and where was the safety, where was the efficacy? And people had some really big concerns about how safe this was going to be. And our job was to drill into what people's um, sources and barriers that would be to them taking a vaccine. And so the challenge for us as comms was really clear to understand what the barriers were and understand how we might help people to do it. So our insight told us what not to do. And you will have all, I'm sure, been exposed to quite a lot of um, social media mis and disinformation as a result of this. And thankfully, they are in the minority, but we will have all heard that there was quite a lot of it. But we also know the truth is if you keep repeating something, then actually, even if it's untrue, it becomes true. And so we took the very deliberate decision. What we wouldn't do is directly tackle dis and misinformation. But what we would instead do is work with a wide range of motivators and uh, spokespeople uh, to help neutralise the dis and misinformation, but to amplify what was actually the truth. And so our insight also showed us what people's motivators and barriers uh, were to taking it. So we also, we, we learned about the things that motivated us were very, very personal. It was about our desire to get back to a normal life and our desire to protect our loved ones. And so there were very, very personal reasons. There would be no point guilt tripping you all or saying it's your civic duty to do it. Actually wanted was that personal motivator. And so therefore our strategy was to go for that, was to go for those personal motivations that would enable and motivate you to go and take the vaccine. Um, again, sorry, we did, sorry, I'm trying to read these notes because this isn't the wrong, this is the wrong slide deck, people. So I'm very sorry you're not seeing the pictures I'm holding in my hot little hands, but um, we did a lot of work around the motivations, as I say, to get back to normal and protect your loved ones. And that some of the barriers were around your safety concerns and uh, worrying about the, the long term impact on your body. And so that is the, something that we that was the motivation for our campaign. And so that became the campaign that meant it's why there are 92% um, of people in the country that have now been vaccinated. And so with apologies for this slightly topsy turvy presentation, I just want to share with you some of the actual comms that we did do beyond the uh, vaccine comms. So we went for a very much a digital first approach. We were, we were doing this on a daily basis and every morning we had a daily pulse meeting where we looked at how all of our digital assets had performed and which ones had worked. 
And we didn't just look at which ones had high engagement, we also looked at those ones that drove the right behaviours. So for example, on the vaccine comms one, we saw that the, the one that had the highest engagement was not the one that drove people to book themselves in to get a vaccination. So we did a daily pulse meeting where we were able to amplify those that worked and delete those that didn't. And as you can see, there's some big numbers on the screen there because you know we were using every channel, but it enabled us to to really test and innovate and work out which channels worked better for which audience and which kind of motivators would work. And as you can see, some really lovely big, um, big numbers there and some famous faces that we worked with. And again, you can see some other examples of some of the partnership work that we did with some big providers. Uh, the BT Tower was an absolute superstar. They would kind of constantly be projecting messaging for us, including figures of um, whenever we reached a milestone for vaccination numbers. But you can also see you know, we worked with some really exciting uh, gaming companies. We also worked with lots of dating providers. So we did a partnership with Grindr. So some really kind of innovative partnership working that enabled us to use their reach and frequencies, but also their channels and their voices to make sure we could reach as many people as possible. And I think going to move us on. So the press partnership, I'm, I'm hoping many of you saw this, but this was an absolute innovation that has never been done before. So we uh, did a partnership with uh, 600 of uh, the newspapers in this country. So it started out obviously being you know, the big daily ones, but actually we recognise you get very high levels of trust from your local newspapers. So we ended up working across 600 print and digital titles, including those in other languages um, and very much targeted at certain demographics. And what they did is they worked with us around a theme and they would use their, their, um, their journalists to go and get their case studies and to write up the story in their own tone of voice, thus driving up trust in what we were saying. And we also used it for the big moments where we wanted to do like a big newspaper wrapper. So hopefully you all saw and took part in the big app download weekend where 15 million people downloaded over the course of the weekend. And it gave us, particularly with the local language and multi multicultural content, real access into audiences that we wouldn't normally have got to. So I've touched on this a wee bit, I'll work with partnerships. Um, we had the broadest range of partners that we were able to work with. And you can see some of them on the screen there. So the kind of, perhaps the usual ones you would expect from a comms point of view being around uh, media, but we also work with finance partners. We, we did a lot of work with charity coalitions, particularly around vaccine, but also around keeping people safe. Had some uh, streaming, uh, lots of young people partnerships. As I say, I'm very proud of the ones we did with the dating apps because it had never been done before. You know, government partnering with Grindr, whoever knew that would be happening. Um, but also, you know, lots of travel companies, people like Greg's. So all of those touch points throughout your life where we were able to really integrate those keep safe messages into what you were doing and enable you to do as much of your life as normally as possible because it's been over two years. So a really broad range of partnerships and we learned as much from them um, as, as we did from them. Uh, this was just a couple of examples of things that you might have seen, but some really creative um, partnerships. The one you can see at the swimming pool there was one that we called Let's Not Go Back. And it was all about as things were opening up and you were able to go and do all of these things again that you'd loved and you'd missed. Uh, let's keep staying safe so that we can keep doing them rather than going back to uh, swimming in your paddling pool. So a wide, really wide range of partners you can see that we worked with. Um, again, a very broad range of PR and influencers. I'm sure you saw them on the video, but obviously government uh, um, and a government as a trusted voice works with one demographic, but it doesn't work with all. And it definitely, uh, you know, it, it waned throughout the course. This was a, a long two year program. And so we work with a wide range of PR influencers and content. And obviously you've got the big name people and I'm sure you all saw the Ian McKellen video, et cetera, et cetera, and Lenny Henry, the big names. But we also worked with really, really, really micro influencers, super targeted into those communities that we wanted to work with. And we also did a lot of work working with media medics. So you will have seen that, you know, the people who go out and sit on the sofas at Good Morning Britain landing our messages. So using the broadest range of voices to deliver um, our messages. And again, you can just see some more examples. And I hope some of these uh, you were served. I particularly did like the Bill Bailey one, just had a, a really lovely refreshingness to it. But as I say, that broadest range of voices to really cut through. And it was, it was genuinely really lovely how many people wanted to work on this because this was something that affected us all. Um, 
um, well, you see a bunch of a bunch of coverage, but as you can see, lots and lots of people willing to talk about it, writing about it. It did feel like for two years that's kind of it was a big topic on everything, but a uh, really good broad range of coverage across a range of channels. Um, this is a strand of work I'm uh, really proud of, which is our last mile work, which was the work we did with um, with local authorities. So the people on the ground who were talking to their communities on a regular basis. So we worked really, really hand in glove with them. We used the, the, I suppose, the buying power of government to be able to produce lots of assets that we did as empty belly. We did an arrange of assets for them, a range of different you know, sizes, formats, etc. And we were able to give that to the local authorities so that they could use it for their local audience, knowing that they knew their audiences better than we did and that they were able to target it. Um, and the one on the bottom right is our streets team, which I'm very, very proud of. They were a team of people who were multilingual, who would literally go in a van in a branded high-vis vest and be on the street and just answer any questions anybody had. We deployed them first time for the app, but then we just used them. They would go out to areas particularly where we, we could see there were rising case rates and able to answer questions from people on the ground, really building trust and rapport and um, engaging with an audience that we might not normally have been able to do. I'm going to whiz us past press briefings because I've done those and I apologise for the chaos of that. Um, and that work that we did with local communities, again, um, we, did a, we translated everything into a base 12, 12 languages as just normal. But we also went all the way up into about 27 uh, languages for most of the things that we did so that we could reach all communities. We, uh, we got a, a BSL interpreter, we put out BSL content, as you can see a really broad range of content uh, put out in a range of languages, including, uh, for the first time for me anyway, uh, producing something in Yiddish, working with the Jewish community um, and using their seniors to get this message out. And what that led to is that programme of comms that hopefully you have all uh, at least witnessed at least one of these, the broadest, uh, biggest uh, comms campaign that government has ever run um, and one which I am uh, incredibly proud of or quite tired as a result of. And then just to kind of give you um, some final stats, yes, so we managed to reach nearly 100% of the population, but what difference did it make? Um, and using my insight and evaluation team and this really rich data source and behaviours um, that we've been tracking throughout time, we've been able to model the ROI um, of our activity. And uh, obviously that's been quite difficult, so we made it really super tight. So from April to December 2020, the comms activities, that's the campaigning, the press conferences, the press, the everything, uh, we believe was responsible for stopping between 1.5 and 1.8 cases of covid and more importantly, uh, for saving between 22, but up to 27 and a half thousand lives, which for me is genuinely something to get out of bed for. Um, and a couple of other stats just to land 25 million people. So thank you all of you for downloading and using the NHS app and uh, using the, those vaccine comms that I talked about. We ended up encouraging it's actually 5.2 million people to go and get the vaccine and that's directly as a result of seeing the communications. So I think I will stop there. Apologies for the slight chaos um, and thank you for everything you all did too. Can you come down?